Sorry, watch your eyes. <laughs> questions while the video was playing and at this time we'll ask Janice to come forward and uh, answer her questions. Let's get ready. Thank you all. I do have a couple of handouts and one of them is the Mind Diet recommendation. So um, I thought I would hand that out that might come to you. Uh, it was, it's, um, redundant of what you have heard, but this is, sometimes it's nice to actually see it um, as well, so. Uh, Janice, just so everyone can hear you, we appreciate it. <laughs> this is a small room for a mic, but <laughs> okay. So, I'm, I'm gonna go over a few things, but um, we can also start just with with questions, if you have any questions. Okay. Maybe you will, as we are uh, going over the materials, the handout. I have extra ones, David, if we uh, still have a few. Okay. So, the mind diet, I'll just talk in general. And um, if you've ever heard of the DASH diet, there's the DASH diet and the Mediterranean. Just okay. That's okay. Uh, so the mind diet is a really kind of a hybrid of the Mediterranean diet, which has been out there. A lot of people have heard about it, and something called the DAP DASH diet. If uh, if you had high blood pressure and went into the hospital, or the doctor knew you were going to have surgery in a couple of weeks, a lot of times they would put you on the DASH diet to bring your um, blood pressure down significantly in a really quick period of time. But it's very strict and uh, people had a hard time following it. The Mediterranean diet, great diet, but once again, people really had a hard time following it. There were benchmarks and they weren't quite sure how much of the Mediterranean diet that you had to be able to comply with to see the benefits. And so, and it also had a real heavy fish base uh, component to it. If you love uh, seafood, if you love fish, not a problem. If you don't have access to fresh seafood or, you know, kind of not people's sometimes uh, cup of tea, then once again, compliance were an issue. So, as it mentioned, uh, Rush University Medical School really put a lot of investment in something called the MIND diet. And uh, it took kind of parts of different diets and really did a research to see what was the threshold of a diet that would maybe cause uh, benefits for cognitive health. Um, and I would say the research is still there. I mean, can you overcome Alzheimer's by simply a diet? Mm, probably not. I mean, you know, I think that's a little um, out there. However, a lifetime approach of, of the mind diet certainly would decrease your risk. Even um, picking up the mind diet later in life seems to prolong maybe the onset. Even with early stage Alzheimer's, the mind diet is recommend, recommended because it does seem to show some improvements. So that the handout is really very straightforward. Uh, the great thing about the mind diet is it's not all or nothing. So incorporating some of it seems to have some benefits, so that's kind of nice. The reason why people step away from diets is because it's life changing and they feel like I don't have any wiggle room. I mean, you know, if I devote my life, my entire life and all of my efforts, I can probably be 100% compliant. So what I would encourage you to do is to, um, do some takeaways. What can I incorporate and that would be easy to incorporate into my diet? Uh, I still may have an opportunity to splurge or to do something that's not on the mind diet 
or crosses over to the bottom to limit or eliminate. But I'm still, I'm going to pick up the blueberries. I'm going to pick up the, the um, you know, baby spinach is so easy because it's mild. You can stick it in about anything and you won't taste the results of it. So we'll just talk, um, talk through. So on the top end, to add or increase those whole grains, so important. That's, um, this is an easy way of looking at it. I didn't develop it. Kelly, who we work with, a nutritionist, pulled all of this out and put it in this template, which I like, because it gives you three servings per day. I mean, you know, that's really what we should strive for. And it's 100% whole grain. Three leafy vegetables, at least one per day. Uh, kale, if you like kale, as I said, I usually recommend spinach because it's so mild. Most, at least three times a week, I take, um, you know what one of those bullets are, the kind of food processing things? I, um, I put frozen strawberries, and this is great to know, frozen berries have the same nutritional value as fresh. Okay, same nutritional value as fresh. Because sometimes we don't want to run out and buy all this fresh food and then the week gets by and it's time to clean out the refrigerator and you're throwing it out. So fresh, I put fresh, three fresh uh, strawberries in there, large. I put blueberries in there. I put a half of a banana, which is great for potassium, and it also cuts that acidy taste of the berries. And I put pomegranate juice, a powerhouse of a nutrient in there, and mix it all up. And when it's mixed, I put a big clump of baby spinach in there. You can't taste it. And I have an amazing fruit smoothie. You can pay $5 for it down at Tropical Fruit Smoothie on Keys and Pie, or you can make it a, a home for a fraction of that. But think about that. It's, it's great, it's refreshing, it tastes good, you can drink about that much, and knock out so many of these uh, recommendations. Non-starchy vegetables, at least one per day. So those are the carrots, the cucumbers, broccoli, uh, tomatoes, celery to put in. This is a great time of year to be talking about um, these uh, items because you can get them fresh. And then the berries, gosh, they're, they're known as the brain food because they are just so rich in antioxidants and some things that are really critical to the brain. So looking there at strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, um, and most things that are dark on the outside and dark on the inside, a lot of times they have some antioxidant properties in them which are really beneficiary. Uh, proteins, fish or seafood, at least once per week. So that's not too terrible, significant. If you like seafood, um, then that's an easy thing to incorporate. Uh, portrait, the fish and other things, um, two times a week, so. So I'm surprised to see shrimp there because I thought shrimp was very high in cholesterol. Um, you know, you can have some cholesterol, but shrimp is one of the ones, and it's ones that people like. So I think you have to come up with what are some things that you can put in here that people, that people like. And, you know, keeping your cholesterol low is critically important. But cholesterol is interesting. I'll just take a little side step on cholesterol. Um, cholesterol is interesting because um, our body makes cholesterol, our body transports cholesterol, and our body tries to get rid of cholesterol, and we get cholesterol from foods. If, if we were to all eat the exact same diet, and we said, okay, do a blood panel on us, and let's see where our cholesterol are. We're exercising, we eat the same, you know, maybe we're siblings and we're growing up in the same house. Uh, a lot of times our cholesterol would be different. Some of that is how, how you are genetically engineered to be efficient with getting rid of cholesterol. Some people 
live on a very strict diet and, you know, gosh, they have to take a statin to get their um, cholesterol below the recommended levels. So I would say, you know, with any of this, if you have um, a tendency to have high cholesterol, then, you know, you want to always be mindful to um, stay away from foods that could contribute to that. My dad um, was a smoker. He ate bacon and eggs every morning, lived to be 82, had a little bit of COPD, but um, his cholesterol was always pretty low. And my cholesterol is low too. I think um, regardless of when I'm on diet, off diet, when I, whatever I eat. So I think, um, you know, part of that is the cards that you've been dealt. But you need to know your cards so that you can modify and try to influence that by um, the choices you make with diet. Thank you. That was, that was a great note. Um, nuts and seeds. Almond walnuts are just incredibly healthy uh, for, for you. Uh, one serving per day. Sunflower seeds, if you love those, which I do, I love pumpkin seeds. Um, they're great to sprinkle on salads, um, that type of thing. Beans, uh, peas, lentils, at least um, three to four times per week. Good source of protein. What do you call the serving? Um, a smaller portion, I guess. You know, it just depends on what it is. For the berries, it's half a cup. And so for, you know, most things um, would, would be the smaller, I guess, serving rather than a, a huge uh, serving at yet. But if you can measure things in cups, it's usually a half a cup, if that makes sense. Um, of course, olive oil is great, all types of olive oil. And also, I've gotten into uh, avocado oil as, as well. Avocados have some good um, um, properties in them as well. One of the problems with these diets that have certain amounts, for instance, I weigh half again as much as my wife. Maybe a little more. <laughs> so, so my body requires more calories, more food than than hers would. And some people don't realize that when they're looking at something in print, that's the gospel. And you know, for for some people it would be too much. Some people it might not be enough. Exactly. And let me just say, this should not be the only foods that you're eating. So you're trying on the top half to incorporate, on the bottom half to limit, and then there's a lot of things in between that as, as well to add, to add to it. But this is encouraging you to be mindful, um, certainly, yes. Uh, people, you know, I think most people are recommended about... 1,200 calories per day, but that fluctuates with age and height and a lot of other variables. I, I've got an interesting anecdote here. I like bacon, and I maybe have bacon twice a week, but the grease <laughs> on the bacon is an ideal uh, solvent for turmeric, because turmeric is not water soluble, and turmeric is very, very good in a diet. So when I get a piece of bacon out, I sprinkle turmeric on it. <laughs> okay, so Dr. Fox is what we call working the diet. <laughs> you know? and, and that's really one of the things for the mind diet is that, you know, so you know, you begin to understand what I can, what I should be adding to. And actually, you know, adding to helps to balance things that may not be as, um, uh, have as uh, uh, important of a nutritional value to it. So yeah, I think that's, you know, that would be a great takeaway. Can, can I do this and this and this? And you know, with all of this, you need to live your life too. So um, that's, a, that's a good point. And, and I think um, people who are successful at incorporating some things realize that quality of life is important. And if that you know, X, Y, Z is important to you, you figure it out. How can I add enough good to maybe balance that, 
balance that out. We cross over to the limit or uh, eliminate, um, which eliminating it would be okay, but certainly limiting it. And really, as, as you look down at those, you know, categories, <clears throat> one of the things that really drives that is the saturated fats. So, which, you know, we're, um, we're looking at saturated fat coming from um, animal and unsaturated, for the most part, with a few exceptions, comes from plants. So as you cross over the border there, you will see red meat. Um, they said no more than three, but this has no more than four per week. So, you know, it's not like, that's the beauty of the mind diet. It doesn't say, you know, stop eating all red meat. I will say one thing to, um, for you to think about with your red meat choices, of course, a smaller portion. And then, you know, like fillets or something that's a little bit more lean. Whenever you see that pretty marble, um, you know, striping going through, it might taste good, but, you know, it's, it's adding to the fat as well. Oh, this is a hard one for me. I love cheese. I really do. So no more than once a week, and um, you know, once again, as they said, what's the deal with the cheese? And that's the, you know, heavy saturated fat. Except not all cheese, but most. Um, solid saturated fats. So you know, we want to limit butter. I would say margarine just should be taken off the market. Now, I don't have any investment in anything. I'm just saying. Oh, margin, this great butter type thing. Well, it's been it's been changed. It's yeah. to um, so I don't know. You know, it, it has some to me some disturbing properties <laughs> to it. Um, so I would um, I would say we'd be better off to go with the um, dairy butter uh, a, a, a pure food than we would to go to with margarine. You mentioned the, the avocado. Uh, I understood that to be real high in cholesterol. Well, once one uh, high in cholesterol, it uh, it is higher than some, but it's um, the it has some antioxidant properties that are very very good. Avocado oil is is what you know I said, and it works well uh, unless you get your cooking temperature up. You know, really, the heat gets up. But if you don't have, you know, issues and your cholesterols are within a range that your doctor is comfortable with, avocados are a good source of um, of some uh, antioxidants that kind of work on these free radicals that are um, in this causing some some damage and some problems. So. Um, coconut oil, so you know. Uh, there are very few absolutes in this world. If you find some absolutes, then, uh, you know, and, and coconut oil, I would say, is interesting in that it, it does have saturated fat, yet it comes from a plant. And uh, so it's kind of in that gray area. One rule of thumb, if you've ever um, had a can of coconut oil, or when you open it up, it's solid. It's not liquid. And so a lot of times a um, solid fat will be indicative of being um, uh, saturated. So it may have, you know, there's been white papers on coconut oil and um, Alzheimer's. Is it beneficiary for the brain? Is it not? You can see Rush, when they did the study, really encouraged no more than um, one tablespoon per day. So I wouldn't, you know, if you're putting it in your coffee, I would stick to that because you may cross over that point where the benefits begin to decrease um, with the returns. So sweets and desserts, so no more than one per week, or sugary drinks or Coke or that. One per week. Um, sugar and the brain, the brain, you know, um, sugar is, is kind of toxic in some ways, and that includes sugar is sugar, so honey and 
that honey's better probably than some processed food, I mean processed sugar, but um, you know, um, it ends up not being so great for the brain. You raise your um, blood sugar way up, and then your blood sugar goes down. The brain can kind of become addictive. It likes sugar. So it's also like, give me more, give me more. You know, if you, if you step away from sugar, you have cravings to begin with, and they tend to slowly kind of go away, but the, the brain really tries hard to stay connected to um, sugar. People in um, cultures who don't have processed sugar and they um, eat from the farm rather than the corporation, they do really well. I mean, they still get their sugars from fruits and, you know, it's the blackberries and the thing that they really savor. But the corporations um, know that we can become addicted to, you know, Coke and those kind of things, and so they play on that. Uh, and so it can be sometimes hard to step away from that. But no more than one per week. So I think with all of this, you're not saying never eat sugar. So just say, you know, would I like my wife's homemade apple pie or would I like a bunch of hard candy? You know, make those choices um, as well. And then fried foods, no more than uh, one per week. And it's that saturated fat that tends to come. Where, does, where do fruits fit into this? Bananas, apples, oranges, grapefruit? Mm -hmm. So I talked about the berries. And so with the mind diet, it's important to get the berries in because of the properties that they have. But beyond that, yes, you know, eat the other fruits. Eat the, for different, for, for different reasons. So eat apples, because you need fiber. So, you know, you're gonna get that. You need bananas or a source of potassium. Most people will need that. So. You know, most of that would be good. Now, you know, if you do a blood panel and your uh, triglycerides are high, your doc may say, oh, let's, let's pull back. Are you eating a certain amount of food? I, I hope that everyone annually has, um, you know, their, their physical and you have a blood panel done that really goes through all sorts of, of uh, of different indicators and you know typically they'll have normal ranges this range and if you're high then they might make an adjustment because you know if you ate all fruits and and not some other things then you know you'd be at, at, at risk from um, your body not being able to process that natural sugar that they that they have but those sorts of fruit haven't uh, proven in the studies to Help or hurt. A cognitive, right. Like I said, you, you need fiber, uh, which you might get from some of this, but apples are a great source of, of fibers to make the rest of your systems, you know, work well. Um, There's a question here so, on the front yeah, row. What, what if you, what about sucralose versus uh, that you find in a lot of fruit drinks like cranberry juice? You know, the bottle of juices, you'll see those that have very low uh, sugar content, but there's in the bottom entry is going to be sugar, sucralose, which is sugar as well. Uh, um, now, but on the other hand, you'll get find those that are like pretty high in the milligrams per. Uh, whatever the quantity is, um, ounces, um, but there'll be no sugar added. You know, it's a, so it tells me it's like all fruit-born sugar rather than added sugar um, with no sucralose. Mm -hmm. you know? I answer. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, uh, what they tell you is if you want to drink, for example, a glass of um, oranges, Forget the, the glass of oranges, eat an orange. Because for one thing, are less calories, less sugar, and the orange has fiber that your body needs. And forget any juices, because most of them are not pure, most of them have some type of sugar, sucrose, whatever, even natural sugar, is not good for your body. 
So um, apple juice, eat an apple. They're beautiful apple salad. Uh, they, they get you the most that you can drink, drink water for your thirst. Uh, there is a different mode of diet now out. I was, um, which I more or less knew, but I was watching public TV the other night, and they had a doctor by name, Mark, Dr. Mark Hyman, MD, who is uh, uh, very much involved in the nutrition of people in the United States. As you all probably know, we have a problem with being overweight, way overweight. You don't, but a lot of us do. Uh, the thing is that, uh, I'm sorry, but this would be saying some of it fits, but this new diet, for example, if you eat uh, foods that con they contain cholesterol, such as shrimp, such as eggs, such as red meat, um, this type of cholesterol will not affect your body uh, in the cholesterol to increase or decrease your cholesterol. The reason for it is dietary. Anything that you get from food, it does not affect your body. They have changed a lot around. Like they would tell us not to eat more than four eggs per day. Now he said, he was saying, Dr. Feynman was saying, they asked him, what do you eat? He said, I'll tell you what I eat. In the morning, I eat three eggs, a fruit, <coughs> half a quarter of an apple, and some greens. Uh, what do you eat? For, what do I eat for, for, for lunch? It's a big salad, green salad. Uh, put cucumbers, tomatoes, greens, and then I have a slice of uh, chicken or a slice of fish or red meat, a small steak. Dinner is exactly the same. Why are we talking about these fat diets? Is, you see, they fill up our stomach and we do not need more food. Now, going back to, to beans, in order to get the protein that you get from a small piece of meat, you need to eat three cups of beans. But let's not forget that these cups of beans, yes, they have the protein, but they have a lot of calories also. And these calories make us fat. Oh, sorry. Uh, so things have changed around now. I mean, to, to me to eat three eggs in the morning, which I do eat now, three <laughs> eggs in the morning. My cholesterol is the same. Actually, my good cholesterol is way up in my good I have 200, around 200 cholesterol, but my good cholesterol is above 100. So they, they told, somebody told me you will never die. You know I will die. I'll die someday. I get tired of myself. <laughs> well, so you know, a lot it, is, it is a big change. And for milk, for example, do not eat, drink the skin milk or the 2%. If you want to drink milk, eat, drink the whole milk because the whole milk has that fat and the fat would keep you full. So you would not go in an hour and need more meal for something else to eat. It's a, it's a whole change yeah. in the diet now. It's a, uh, what we used to know from the past, it's, it's changing. It's, uh, yeah. And so, you know, eggs are not on here or really except for to stay away from cheese. That does not mean you should not eat eggs. This is just like, what they, for cognitive, what it showed on brain impact, add this, delete this, and then, you know, make decisions. So what the eggs we used to, me too, we used to eat to, to say, make an omelet out of egg whites, because the egg whites have the protein. They, they tell you now, forget it. You need to put two or three eggs. Eggs kind of got eggs. a bad rap. <laughs> <laughs> because, because the egg yolk contains a lot of the omega-3 vitamin, uh, oils that we need. So I guess everything proportionally and, uh, for, and forget the starches. No starches, no beans, you keep on meats and vegetables. That's like a paleo diet. Well, it is similar, similar, yeah, yes. that's really popular. Yeah, yeah, yeah and this, actually. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, it's a, it's Actually, right. now they say that people who got heavy and they went to the paleo diet, even if, and they lost all the weight, they go back to their doctors, although they ate a lot of meat and a lot of beans, and the cholesterol is down because they lost so much weight, and everything, their body functions are so much better. Well, um, Dr. Fox, yes. Um, this is all very interesting to me as a scientist, and 
um, you've, you've made some really good points, but if you, if you distill those points down, I think you'll find something that I've believed for a long time. We, in the last, I don't know, 80, 100 years, we break everything down and we look at vitamin C by itself, we look at cholesterol by itself, and we forget that nature packaged these things as whole foods. And so that's why eating a whole berry is better than drinking the berry juice. Exactly. Unless we're putting the whole berry into our blender and making our own juice because then it includes all the other stuff. Plus the juice contains a lot of preservatives that they are not supposed to go in bites. No processed foods of any kind. All things that you can touch and you can identify. When you see a hundred different ingredients or twenty different ingredients, one of this and one of that, you don't know even what they are. Well, that's the thing that you do not eat. Yes, ma'am. I'm surprised to see pork in the red meat. I thought it was the other white meat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's to limit. I mean, you know, um, it doesn't really say you, you know. Well, like I said, this diet, what it tried to do was to recognize that, you know, if you like bacon, you're probably going to eat bacon. So now you know, you know, one serving a week would be the right portion of it to, this was all, this is all based on cognitive impact, brain impact. It would be, that would be the threshold, that would be the right amount that, they, the research said, you could incorporate and still do well cognitively and meet the benchmarks cognitive. This is all about brain. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, you know, so, uh, like people are surprised that, that red meat is even on there to, you know, be mindful, be mindful. So, you know, four servings of red meat, that's, that's a pretty healthy, you know, yeah. serving. Yeah. So, I, one thing I will, oh, David, go ahead. I, I was going to say, when you mentioned about the red meat, something I remember um, from the video was that they said, uh, one of the later videos, it said that there was something in the red meat that damaged the, the blood-brain barrier, but they didn't, they didn't go on much about that. So they mentioned, they mentioned about the fat content, you, they wanted to stay away from the fat, but do you know what the, that little bit was about the... The blood-brain barrier. If there was so I'd have to go back and, and read that. Usually, the the uh, brain blood barrier, which keeps harmful things out of the brain, and mm -hmm. it's like a silk stocking almost. Uh, that's really important. Usually, that's tied to sugar, and if you damage the blood vessels by you know being up and down with your um, with your sugar, it, uh, it, might, it it would be the one that would compromise. So I'll have okay. to go back and look at your videos to see the fat, and that might also contribute. But what they're getting at is a um, vascular okay. issue. Okay. Okay. So issue. yeah, they didn't they didn't they, they they talked about red meat really in two contexts. One was the fat, but then this was kind of a. a a bit of a detail that was off by itself, okay. and so I was, I was, I was curious mm -hmm. about that. It must, so it must be the fat that, that the sugar I contributes just, to being um, um, compromising blood vessels. I just recently learned about the amyloid plaque, and that was on uh, on Dr. Oz's show mm -hmm. fairly recently. Yeah, it's that a came up and, I, and explained how that plaque in the brain vessels. You know, it causes Alzheimer's. It causes that part of the brain. You know, mm -hmm. It's just like a stroke anywhere else, but they're really minute in the, in the it's brain. Mm -hmm. so well, that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Amyloid, which leads to plaques. Um, tau, which is a, another um, tau protein, is always present that accumulates, it causes tangles. And then inflammation are the three um, conditions that are always present with, um, with Alzheimer's. So. One thing I was gonna mention, a lot of times people say, what is it with diet in that, um, you know, our grandparents 
were raised on farms and you know they ate more than probably one serving of pork a, a week and you know they ate all of these foods that now um, we hear are problematic and I'll just mention a couple things that could contribute um, to that and one thing is that um, um, and, and you know if you ever watch the Heartland series, do you know what that is locally? You know, they, they do a lot of looking back to this region, the Appalachia traditions, that kind of thing. And so it's, it's interesting because the food was different grown on farms maybe a hundred years ago. Um, and it's the, it's the food that we recognize in Kroger's. It's the corn and it's the type of food, but there's a commercial on that maybe it's for Fabrice or something that says, you know, you can get nose wine. You don't smell the odor, odors in your own house. But I would challenge us to say, we've gone taste blind as well. If you, um, the families that were the farmers, they, they worked and worked and worked to get, not the, um, not the red delicious apples that you see, but the Macintosh. You know, it was their apple, and it was the sweetest, the richest uh, corn. The corn that you buy in the groceries a hundred years ago would probably be its full grain. It would be like what they fed the livestock. I mean, you know, it's the 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 silver queen and the peaches and cream. Um, families took wonderful pride in their seeds and if they were really um, intuitive, they would create hybrids and they, you know, because it was all about the taste, right? It was all about the taste. And those um, foods also had a higher nutritional value to them. They, they had their, their garden. I mean, they may have had a big, big garden, but they worked that soil. They uh, rotated their crops. They um, fertilized it. They became excellent at growing great food. So now we take that and we take it to the corporation. Um, are they interested in ears of corn this big that are so savorable and so uh, um, flavorful and has a lot of nutritional? Or are they interested in growing as much corn as they possibly can? You tell me. If it's not about the money, it's about the money. You need to read a book called The Dorito Effect. The Dorito Effect? <laughs> the Dorito Effect. Like uh, we'll add that to our reading well, list. Does it, what it, is it? It, it? When I was reading it, it talked about like Doritos and how companies, chemical companies have done and changed the taste of all of our foods. Not just, even stuff like they were talking about like chickens and how chickens are, they're not free range anymore, they're fed all this other stuff so they don't taste the same. And this guy was talking about how chicken doesn't taste like he remember his grandmother making the chicken. Yeah, it's so not. he went someplace yeah. else. His grandmother's been one shot well, with you know, somebody else else had the chickens <laughs> and had, you know, actual chicken that wasn't like one of these big corporate farm thingies. Yeah. But it, it talked about all of this stuff, including how, you know, between the chemicals, everything's so processed that it doesn't taste the same. The Dorito effect and they use certain chemicals. Your brain reacts to that chemical, so you keep eating it. Right, right. So that's why you have people who are obese. Corporations make all their money because people keep buying these things. But the food isn't there, the nutrition isn't there, mm -hmm. and it's all because everything's processed. But like eating chickens, <coughs> so there's a whole chapter on chickens. <laughs> and there's yeah, a chapter on the And they were talking about the world. Short, short cattle, as opposed to imitation of an brought in and just fed, yeah, they're fed and cheap grain to beat them up just to the point of whether they can be killed. But it's that, I, I'm gonna read that, the Dorito effect, because I will say, I just put that in your in your mind, in that think about where your food comes from. And well, if you and don't- I up with Macintosh apples, right? <laughs> oh, no, 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 no flavor whatsoever. <laughs> oh, good. Well, if you go up to Cock County, they have apple festival every year, and you They're will not see. The same. I go to, I'm from the northeast. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, it's not the same, but um, if you go up to some of these festivals, they have what's called the heirloom um, vegetables, and 
apples and someone, thank God, have saved these seeds and have passed them down. But I just make you what? Those are pairing them tomatoes. Right, right. Can you taste the difference? Oh, yeah. yeah. So I would say, you know, we've gone taste blind because A, it's what we have, it's convenient. Um, just like sugar, you know, there are chemicals that our brain likes and says, give me more, give me another helping of that, or every time I pass McDonald's, you know, I want to, to go in and have that. But what I, you know, so what's the takeaway? The takeaway is I think we should really think about and be smart about reading labels. Think about meat and where it's coming from. If you're not supporting your local farmers and that kind of thing, you might think about um, doing doing that because you know what's happening with meat is just a whole nother thing with hormones and antibiotics. And by the time you get it on your plate, it's it's way different. The the chicken itself is bred to be to grow fast. You know, because they don't want chickens running around the farm. They're like you know, you get to a certain, so they're enhanced to grow fast so that they can, you know, take them to, to market. So all of that may be, may be affecting our immune system. It's not just cognitive, it's our whole <coughs> system. So even though a hundred years ago our um, ancestors did not have the technology that we have. They did not have the range of, um, you know, choices or the convenience that we had. They may have lived very modestly on their family farms, but they might have had the secret to nutrition. So well, this is what have. they have then, is what we call organic today. <laughs> yeah. uh, and and which you pay a lot more for yes. organic yes. and uh, For and example, for the red beef, uh, what they tell you is it needs to be grass-fed <laughs> beef. Not the, the cows were not supposed to eat grains and whatever other stuff that they feed them to get fat. Yeah, but they gain weight fast on that. Yeah, if you were to go up to a farmer a hundred years ago and say, do you have any grass-fed, you know, beef cows, they would be like, okay, so, you know, yes, that's all we do. So we got them. Are you going to ask them to add 15% water <laughs> before you get it? You know, yeah. and no telling what. Is in that label that yeah. they inject in there to add all the weight, so you're paying. Well, you, you know, by yes. the pound, you're well, paying a lot for it's, just water. It's, not the it's money. important it's to read labels, yeah. and people don't know. I was at a super a little supermarket, and there was the butcher behind it, and it was late on the day. And I, I was going to buy a beef tenderloin, and I said to him, uh, "Is your beef uh, uh, grass fed?" And he looked around and he got mad at me. And he says, I'm not there with a beef, with a cow. How am I supposed to know? And I thought, oh my God, okay, just, just go and don't say anything else. So I left. And he, went, and then he was getting <laughs> um, One thing we haven't talked about that you hear a lot about these days is beets. Can you say something about beets? Well, you know, they're not on the list. Beets have, um, certainly have some good properties, I think, to them, but they're, you know, we don't hear a lot about them um, in relationship to um, cognitive health. They haven't made it on the revised mind um, diet. A lot of people feel like you should incorporate them, certainly into your um, a diet, find a way that you can fix them or put them in. A lot of, uh, it's a, a food that a lot of people don't relish just, oh, I'm going to eat some beets, but you want to share? Um, yeah, we, we have lately um, sliced beets um, about a quarter inch, three eighths of an inch, and roasted them along with some other roasted vegetables. They're very <laughs> delightful. Um, beets from readings that I've done is supposed to be really good for your blood. And I hate to make statements like that because it's way too general, but um, 
And, and even though beets do have some sugar in it, again, the sugar comes packaged with all the other stuff that's in the beet. And I, I, I agree with her that when you get something in the whole fruit or whole vegetable, it's going to be have a lot less negative effect on your body than right. if you purify it out and take it like we've done with our vitamins. We purify out, you know, um, all, all of those stuff that you can buy individually or in a multivitamin. But we're not getting it in its natural form. We'd be so much better off to get the vitamins and the minerals from the whole foods. Absolutely, Lynn. I'll just say a word on vitamins. So, your the best way to get your vitamins is through your food. So, your body gets it. It knows how to process it. Um, vitamins are not regulated. Let me say this. So, there's no vitamins that are FDA approved. They're not regulated. So, the problem with that is you really need to know the source in which you're getting your vitamin because you. You know, vitamins can come, um, some vitamins that would not be uh, uphold the integrity, I guess, would come with coatings that don't break down very easily. So some of it just passes right through, right through your body. So I think the best way, you know, a multivitamin, but the would, you know, wouldn't hurt you and a good conversation to have with your doc. Um, but. Um, and then as we age, sometimes our bodies do not absorb vitamins. So you end up with a, you know, vitamin D shortage or K or, or one of those um, that becomes impossible to get enough sunlight or impossible to, or you wouldn't want to get that much sunlight or impossible to um, eat enough food. And then your doc will say, I want you to have an iron supplement. But that's, um, uh, you know, it, even vitamins are not harmless. So vitamin E, which they recommended 400 international unit, which is pretty standard for that, um, uh, you know, that's something to talk with your doc about because vitamin E is a natural blood thinner. So if you're on blood thinner, you really shouldn't be taking vitamin E, right? You know, you could start to bleed and, you know, might have a little harder time um, the clotting, if you are going to have surgery that's scheduled, a lot of times, you know, they will take you off of that or aspirin. But those greens are also natural blood thinners as well. So, you know, if, I hope you're having conversations with your doctor saying, hey, you know, I think I want to do this. I think I want to add this supplement. You know, is there any reason why I shouldn't? Or, um, you know, it just pays to be mindful of that. Yes, Ms. I learned something not long ago from my neighbor who just got her 50-year gold award for being a 50-year survivor of diabetes. Type 1. Huh? Type 1. Type 1. And she's going strong. She got her PhD, the whole nine yards. She's 50. But what it seems like, I'm bringing that over into what you're talking about. It seems like a way of life not just a diet. We're talking about a way of life. I was a girl who was raised out of the garden all the way through college, okay? My grandparents and my mom. And my grandmother said, everything in moderation, <coughs> but make sure it's good. And it seems like we have, and I think the point's been brought out here, we've gotten lazy. <laughs> yeah. We've gotten lazy, and we don't want to go to the problem of a change of lifestyle. And we need to, if we once you get to be Alzheimer's, it's too late. Yeah. I mean, you may hold it a little bit, but that's a frightening thing. If you've ever been acquainted anyway with Alzheimer's, you may wish you had it, but it's time to start now and change your lifestyle. It seems to me like it's a way of life. She says diabetes is not a disease, it's a way of life. Mm -hmm. And you take care of it. Well, when you start eating foods that are whole foods and maybe foods that you know we've talked about that you could find from a, uh, a farmer or food, um, 
Um, I think it will feel better, and I think you'll um, also start to taste the difference. You've been very patient. Yes. Uh, sugar in any form, potatoes, rice, various forms, <clears throat> is the culprit. And uh, I had two friends. One had cancer of breast. They did a biopsy or something. Then she had one breast removed. Four times it came back. <clears throat> the fourth time she they said to do chemo and radiation. Radiation, and she said, "You're not killing me." <clears throat> her doctor about strangled her. She went on the paleo diet, cut all sugar. She always said she was a sugar addict. He was so mad. He said, "If you're not back here in two months, and that is spread throughout your body, I will be surprised." Two years later, she went back. There was not one trace of cancer. He said, "You have been." All odds. <clears throat> so, um, uh, what was the other? Uh, somebody else. I'm trying to think of the second case. But anyhow, they know that that sugar causes cancer, and the pharmaceutical companies just want to keep pushing the insulin and. Sugar is, is addictive, as I said, the brain kind of, you know, so that's why people, and, and you know, now it's, that's why Coca-Cola made the formula really sweet back in the day, you know, um, because once your, your, your brain connects with that, it's like a big reward for the brain. Sugar, especially processed sugar, is not all sugar, it's, um, it, it, the brain reacts to it. Um, and that it usually wants more. Are they That's working right. with the medical, uh, with doctors going to medical school with nutrition and teaching them about no, this no, so that they can educate their patients in the proper way? Oh, I know the other friend uh, from high school, she was diagnosed as being diabetic and she got there quickly enough, uh, she was almost gone, but out at Trinity, they put her on a diet, like very similar to this. It wasn't cognitive, it was for diabetes, but sugar, all sugar out. And she, he, the doctor said, you have a choice. Diet or die. <laughs> Make your choice. You <laughs> it was that clear to her, and she chose the diet. And she goes out, and she, that bread comes off the hamburger. <laughs> All the carbs are gone. Comment about uh, fish. Uh, I noticed a lot of times I go to the market, fish is not raised, it's been covered, so I think it's going to be the same realm of uh, processing you see in beef, uh, feed garden and stuff, because there's a lot of uh, food to make them go fast and not necessarily a natural diet. And even in the ocean, these are open ocean fish waters, especially, yeah. especially the Atlantic salmon. And uh, anybody have comments about uh, those resources? And this catfish farms and the stuff, and tilapia farms. So. Well, you know, um, you have a comment about what you said about fish farms? Or no, but just okay. let me insert. We've said a lot about diet, but almost nothing about exercise. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to end with that. So, uh, end, with that. Uh, let me just address this. Anytime you have um, commercial raising of animals, just like the corn and everything else, you know, you're at risk for them trying to get the product to the market quickly to save costs and to get their proceeds. So I would say with fish, fish farms, you know, even though um, uh, I would just say you're at, at risk for someone who didn't have your nutritional value at heart, but they wanted to, you know, have, have the proceeds from it. So I, um, I would always say be Leery of that. Don't be afraid to be inquisitive and ask about your fish and where it came from. Um,
mention about going to the market and asking for this grass fed and what she doesn't know. Yeah, but now they put labels, so it's like the fees, why, some, 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 some talks about guidelines for other things for cognitive health. So get regular exercise. And so they are in the bold. Uh, you know, people always want to say, what does that mean? What's the least amount of exercise I can possibly do and still get the benefit? So what it looks like is 30 to 40 minutes uh, a day five times a week, so, and that's getting that heart rate up, you know, so it's it's doing something, uh, brisk walking with swinging your arms, doing um, jogging, that kind of thing, some, some things there. Exercise is becoming just like diet. I mean, people are really amazed at the health benefits of exercise. It's free for the most part, unless you want to buy an extensive uh, gym, uh, you know, or something, but it's, uh, and once again, you know, a hundred years ago, if you said to a farmer, hey, um, you know, go walk on this stationary treadmill, they would say, for what? You know, I've been hauling hay in the lower bottom, I don't need to do one more thing, but we're changing. Society is changing. So now the things that were just a part of our survival and our life are becoming things that now we have to think about incorporating. Eat a healthy diet, that's just a recap. We've talked a lot about that. Engage, engage the brain. I hope you all are all engaged. I, I love this uh, Science Cafe because it's, it's um, thought-provoking and problem-solving and uh, stay uh, certainly connected. Look at um, the various things on the back side, common conditions that affect brain health. On the negative side, heart disease, high blood pressure, know your numbers, get those blood panels, diabetes, stroke, yeah. uh, not being knocked out, brain injury, depression, sleep. Sleep is a whole fascinating area. Are you sleeping or are you just think you're sleeping? If you're taking those PMs or you're taking sleeping pills, you're really not perhaps getting the type of sleep that's beneficial. That's a whole other topic. Um, but sleep, like I said, these are all things that we know, but our lifestyle has interrupted them. Uh, certain risk of threats include improper use of medications, excessive alcohol use, excessive alcohol use, poor nutrition, um, and lack of um, physical activity. So we've just got maybe uh, eight or nine minutes left. So someone want to say a word before I turn it over to David? Yes. i like to say also that uh, for Alzheimer's, a good night's sleep is very important. Uh, yet, between eight and nine hours of sleep, um, I was listening to all this consider. I was wondering why people like, for example, Pat Summit, why did she die at such a young age from Alzheimer's? She was fit, she was active, she, her brain was always active. Why would that woman would die from Alzheimer's? The same thing with Margaret Thatcher, Prime Minister of England. The thing is, lack of sleep. And how they explained it on, on the radio was, like when you fall asleep, the, your brain, it's sort of, your head inside, it's like a dishwasher. It cleans up your brain, like the dishwasher goes into cycles and cleans the dishes. That's what sleep does, cleans up your brain of different toxins and this and that. And people who don't get those hours of sleep, they don't get to clean up their brain and it accumulates over time. That's how they explain it in a very simple way. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to add, I, <clears throat> I, so many people are, are running and cycling excessively, 
and I've talked to several people who have, have done that and said you almost get addicted to the adrenaline rush. So excessive exercise, I think people need to be aware of yeah. becoming addicted to it to the point that there's they said they couldn't stop running. running. There's they something can, called a jogger's high that people they get addicted to the endorphins. Yeah. Your body releases endorphins. It's, and it it's the endorphins, not, not yeah, the adrenaline. Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, something <laughs> called a jogger's high <laughs> that you can kind of become addicted to. Yeah. Everything in moderation. You know, um, at age 60, the joints begin to break down because of the impact. So, anyway. One last question. Last final question. Or comment? I don't care for red wine. Yes? Does white wine not do anything? Yes. You know, alcohol uh, in moderation actually has some, some good um, properties. So, that's interesting. Red wine has some great properties because of the antioxidants and it has some, um, maybe some vascular um, incentives as well. But it's kind of interesting to take on alcohol. If you, but don't start drinking, you know, if you are, um, if you don't drink, I don't think, uh, I don't think the, the research uh, points you in that direction. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Just uh, take a quick look at the website, of course, today, June 13th, well, that was our topic today. Next month, as I scroll up here, we actually have uh, the same topic happening twice. Uh, the first one is on July 11th, that's a Thursday, and that'll be right here at the library. And then also, uh, about two weeks later, on Tuesday, July 23rd, we'll be at our old meeting location one more time at Zoo Knoxville. So, um, our speaker for next month is uh, this guy right here, Stephen Lynn Bales. If you uh, um, don't know him, he used to uh, be employed at uh, Iams Nature Center as one of their naturalists for a long time. Uh, he's an author multiple times over, uh, writing different books about science and nature. And so, um, there's a lot of people that I've met through the Science Cafe that they all seem to know Stephen. I'm expecting that to be pretty pretty well attended. So we scheduled two of them. Um, and uh, the topic is the summertime cicadas, which we should start hearing pretty soon. And uh, he's also going to talk about writing science books. So if you know anybody that has interest in either of those areas, uh, uh, let them know about this meeting and uh, we'll start advertising it as of you know tonight. I don't have the flyers to help, for you to help me pass out, but just through word of mouth, let the folks know about it, whether they're interested in the cicadas or about the uh, science, uh, being a science author. And then as we go forward to August, um, uh, our topic is called Living Volcanoes. Um, that'll be August 8th here at the uh, library. Uh, it's not about the uh, geology, really, of or, or the, the, the actions of... Uh, Lake Tectonics Truth and I have, this is about the organisms that live inside volcanoes. Um, so I don't know if you can see the flyer very well, but basically there's a face there, and they're wearing the headlamp on their on their helmet, um, and they're looking at these organisms. This is this is in a lava tube in Hawaii earlier this year. And uh, Annette's, uh, Annette Ingalls is uh, at the University of Tennessee in uh, uh, Department of Earth and Plan Planetary Sciences. I've been trying to get her to come speak for us for a couple of years. I was actually trying to recruit her for a topic on uh, the Gulf oil spill that happened what, like seven years ago and how's the Gulf doing. Um, and I called her, I finally said, oh, we've got a date when you can come. And it worked out on her schedule great. And she says, yeah, but now I'm going to be crawling around in these volcanic lava tubes. <laughs> I said, well, we'll talk about lava tubes. Maybe we'll hear from the other time. But anyways, this is going to be very fascinating. And Nova, the Nova uh, production was, was being filmed at this time. So this is actually a clip from, from the TV show that uh, it aired just a couple weeks ago. Um, and then uh, moving ahead to September, we have one more topic scheduled in, on September 19, again here at the library on sinkholes. And our guest speaker is uh, Susan Garawecki. She's she was actually um, 
uh, a returning speaker. She spoke at one of our meetings in 2012. Um, a geologist working professionally here in Knoxville, and she's going to be talking about sinkholes. Uh, it's a topic that hit home for pretty close to home for me. I actually had a sinkhole, a small one, uh, in my front yard, and uh, so I had. As of two years ago, I have you know a new septic system drain field and all that kind of stuff. It was an adventure, but the, it was just a little bubble of air in the earth, rising in the earth, just like it was, uh, just like you know water, bubbles in a in a in water. And thankfully, it wasn't the kind that eats houses. I just had a little baby sinkhole, but it was it was significant for one person. But. Um, Right across the street over here, where the fresh market is, just about three or four years ago, they had a large sinkhole open up and devour that whole parking lot. Um, so uh, you may know somebody that's that's lives close to that or just very interested, but tell them about that uh, September 19. And this is uh, you go to knoxsciencecafe.org. You can see this uh, this list on our website there. Um, David Fox has uh, something uh, to share, and then we'll and then we'll be done for the evening. David, um, some of you know that um, back in 2016, I started a think tank. We meet every other weekend um, in our home. Would this would this help to? Hello. Can you hear me better? <laughs> and. Um, I have some brochures if anybody is interested in knowing about the think tank and what we do and if you would like to join us, how you can do that. So if you'll raise your hand, those of you who are interested, I have a brochure on what we do and that's it. <laughs> So again, I want to thank everybody for coming out, and uh, uh, we'll be back here. Excuse me, we'll be back here in about a month, and uh, so uh, be sure and grab a brochure or uh, some more snacks on your way out. We don't really like leftovers, so take them with you. Thanks everyone for coming. Have a good night. Good evening.